The city of Pine Bluff, Arkansas is home to a population of over 40,000, as well as Bayou Bartholomew, the longest bayou on the planet and the state's first ever purpose-built casino. It may not be the most diametrically opposed location on the earth to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but at more than 1,100 miles southwest of the heart of Philly, it's plenty of distance from the city of brotherly love. Extreme Championship Wrestling notably made its home in Philadelphia throughout its lifetime, but on January 13th, 2001, the fabled revolution died in Pine Bluff of all places. A crowd of 1,300 probably didn't realize it going in, but they witnessed the final ever ECW event, the culmination of a sad and torturous decline for the promotion that wants to find pro wrestling's rebellious spirit. I'm Jack from Cultaholic, and this is the true story of ECW's dying days. For as many words have been uttered about the gritty ECW vibe, its industrial influence, and its devoted cult-like audience that merrily bathed in all things extreme, just as many have been said of its shortcomings. Chiefly, as a business, ECW found itself continually stuck in a precarious no-man's land. Never a major money earner on its best day, Paul Heyman's organization experienced financial difficulties throughout its lifetime. While they grew respectively enough from their bingo hall roots into a company that ran decently sized civic centers and auditoriums, there was a clear ceiling above their heads, perhaps due in part to the unadvertiser-friendly product that ECW churned out. Additionally, with their limited resources, Heyman also had to shell money out to compete with the big boys, monetarily placating quality talents that might be inclined to find better deals for themselves elsewhere. Popular as they were, ECW was a small fish in a big pond. As Heyman himself summarized in a quote from the promotion's dying days, ECW was too big to be small time, but too small to be big time. Even while they were finalizing a deal to bring their wares onto national cable channel TNN in the summer of 1999, ECW was believed to be in serious financial peril. And despite gaining a major TV foothold, ECW apparently still had to foot the bill for production costs for the program, worth an estimated $25,000 per week, according to the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. To make matters more difficult, their relationship with TNN was a highly contentious one. And as noted, they weren't entering into the co-op at their absolute strongest time. The onset of the TNN era already saw ECW lose three of their cornerstones in Taz and the Dudley Boys to the WWF, but other valuable stars flew the coop one by one come the turn of the century. Sabu quit the promotion in March, leading to some contentious legal issues over the validity of his contract, and a month later, reigning champion Mike Awesome, who was tired of not getting paid, jumped to WCW in yet another messy situation that required legal intervention. Lance Storm, also fed up with missed payments, bolted for WCW in May, though at least his exodus was pretty clean and painless. Meanwhile, Raven's second go-round in ECW ended that July, cordially finishing up before a move to the WWF. Of those seven aforementioned names, six of them, all except Sabu, represented ECW in the group's entry into the 2001 Invasion storyline, so that should give you an idea of just how valuable those men were to promotional law. And hey, Sabu, lack of Invasion participation aside, was as much a one-man representation of ECW mythology as anyone could possibly be. So to sum it all up, that's a lot of star power lost in just one year. Other than bringing the Sandman back and trying to build up a promising young Rhino, there wasn't much on the acquisitional counterbalance that seemed to hold clear main event potential. But lost talents can be a drop in the bucket compared to losing your national TV outlet. After a mere 13 and a half months on the air, ECW and TNN's partnership came to an end. Not that the cancellation of ECW on TNN was a sudden development, in the year plus that the show aired, they all always seemed to be issues between the two sides. Whether it was TNN wanting to tone down the, you know, the extremeness of the product, or Heyman feeling that TNN and parent company Viacom were doing the bare bones minimum to promote the one hour Friday night show. There was also that charming anti-TNN rant that Heyman spewed during a June 2000 episode, which the network aired with the verbiage bleeped out. TNN also ran a crawl that spoke condescendingly of Heyman and his mental state. If anything, Viacom seemed to be a little more starstruck by WWF and 
its main property, Raw is War. In the June of 2000, Viacom won the broadcast rights to Raw and WWF's other USA Network programs to begin airing on TNN in the autumn. Friday, September 22nd looked to be the final episode of ECW on TNN, but the program lingered for a little bit longer. Though there was an exclusivity clause in the WWF deal, Vince McMahon agreed to waive it for ECW's benefit, allowing a theoretical competitor to remain on the same network as his programs. In theory, this would enable ECW to continue shopping around for a new cable TV home, without losing their means of broadcasting for the time being. It was just another example of McMahon helping Heyman. He'd subsidized the company to the tune of $587,500 previously, but despite McMahon initially permitting ECW to remain in its Friday night TNN slot through the end of 2000, the stay of execution proved brief. Despite WWF's allowance, TNN wasn't as openly willing to keep ECW on for three extra months. They merely agreed to keep ECW on for two more broadcasts through October 6th, pending further discussion about the future. The initial Raw on TNN broadcast didn't feature a single commercial for ECW's program, so that should pretty much tell you how the network felt about their, you know, their other wrestling show. Ultimately, ECW and TNN ended their relationship on Wednesday, October 11th. Despite hopes that Heyman could quickly broker a new deal with another cable out Outlet, say the now wrestling free USA network, nothing actually materialized. Throughout the years, rumors have persisted that Heyman no showed a spate of events around this time due to being out in Los Angeles, reportedly trying to get a new TV deal. Stories had it that Heyman was meeting with representatives from the USA network and FX, but some ECW alumni have made an interesting claim. A few outspoken talents, including New Jack and CW Anderson, have publicly said that Heyman was actually filming scenes for the remake of Rollerball rather than actively trying to save ECW. Heyman contradicted these claims when Anderson made them in 2017, saying that he didn't film his scenes in Los Angeles, but rather in Yonkers, New York, and not until 2001, after ECW's death. IMDb lists Yonkers among its filming locations, which does support Heyman's explanation. However, it also lists the production dates for the movie as stretching from July to November of 2000, which doesn't support Heyman's offered time frame. However, the movie did undergo reshoots in the summer of 2001, which IMDb doesn't list, after a test screening of the ball went very poorly, not that the finished product was that good anyway. Whichever version of events is true, it doesn't really matter. ECW lost their national TV deal regardless. All ECW had going for them on a national stage, besides now monthly pay-per-views, were its lesser distributed syndicated show, Hardcore TV, and a relationship with the music-centric USA network show, FarmClub.com, which failed to help land ECW anything further on the channel. The only other option appeared to be Fox Sports Net, but it wasn't a financially viable one. At this point, ECW could ill afford to involve themselves with guaranteed money losers because they were already losing plenty. Video game publisher Acclaim, the driving force behind two poorly received ECW titles, sunk $350,000 into the company earlier in 2000 to help cover payroll, but it was quickly becoming a fire that available means couldn't put out. By September, reports indicated that wrestlers were four weeks behind in pay. After a TV taping that month in Ontario, the wrestlers weren't paid and were instead informed that their checks would be FedEx to them later in the week after the currency was converted. As Dave Meltzer wrote, that promise was not followed up on. To make matters even worse, live events in Nebraska and Iowa scheduled for mid-September were cancelled. October was spent trying to play catch-up on pay, as by mid-month, ECW had gotten down to just two weeks behind on checks. Heyman even supposedly balked at hiring recent free agent Juventu Guerrera, partially because bringing in a pricey name while others were still owed money probably wouldn't have been that good for morale. But one name who did show up for an unexpected cup of coffee was a pretty big star in his own right, Scott Hall. He worked a pair of events in New York State in November, but never officially appeared on ECW syndicated television, despite the company incessantly plugging the news of his arrival throughout the hour-long show. The story going around was that Hall agreed to work the shows for free, which the locker room apparently didn't believe. Some viewed it as Heyman bringing in an outsider, which is literal in more than one sense, during a period where the regulars weren't being consistently paid, while trying to assure those talents that he was being sympathetic to their lack of income. While those New York shows went on as planned, cancellations elsewhere only continued. Events in Camden, New Jersey and Bethlehem, Pennsylvania at the end of October were pulled from the schedule. Still, ECW trucked along, but they had to do so without their top star, Rob Van Dam. After working TV tapings through the first week of October, the 29-year-old former TV champion went off to Thailand to film the action movie Black Mask 2. He ended up missing shows in the state of Michigan, including his long-stated hometown of Battle Creek. There was more than just filming keeping RVD out of the ring. He was also 
owed a lot of money. Rumors emerged that RVD had quit ECW due to the money troubles, which he publicly denied. Still, he and ECW were both keeping mostly quiet on the subject while they worked to settle the issue. His future with the company was uncertain enough that his name was never mentioned once during the November to Remember pay-per-view in Chicago, Illinois. As December dawned, the situation only grew bleaker. Live events in Dallas and Houston for that month were canceled, and wrestlers fell behind a reported six weeks on pay. Dave Meltzer reported that Heyman initially was hesitant to promote the Massacre on 34th Street pay-per-view for December 3rd because he wasn't even sure who would be appearing on the card. Van Damme took to his website to discuss his prolonged absence, saying in part, as of today, I am definitely an employee with ECW and I haven't spoken with anybody else. The outlook from right now is somewhat questionable. Whenever I'm working for somebody, I'm there 110%, so as of now, I'm still with ECW and I definitely hope to see it take off. However, by mid-December, Van Damme had reportedly asked to be let out of his contract, as did longtime on-screen rival Jerry Lynn, who had been ECW world champion as recently as November 5th. Heyman allegedly went so far as to try and help Lynn get hired by WWF around this time. Reportedly speaking with Bruce Pritchard at the November 28th SmackDown tapings in Lynn's native of Minneapolis. One veteran ECW star that did leave was New Jack, an ECW mainstay since 1995. He last wrestled in a dark match at the December pay-per-view before parting with Heyman at an event in Queens, New York two weeks later. That Queens show on December 15th at the Elks Lodge, which ECW fans know best as the Madhouse of Extreme, was a historic one. Bubba Ray and Devon Dudley were on loan from WWF for one night to team with Tommy Dreamer in a six-man tag. Meanwhile, fellow WWF star Taz briefly re-emerged to share the ring with two of his pupils, reigning tag team champions Danny Doring and Roadkill. In yet another ominous sign, while the venue did sell out to its seating capacity of 800 patrons, there was none of the standing room overflow of years past. Tickets being priced up at $40 to $60 may have played a part. Eight nights later, the company ran for the final time at the ECW Arena in Philadelphia. Just like with Queens, the seats were filled, but there was none of the standing room excess of a promotion that was running Hot. This was the final card before the guilty as charged pay-per-view on January 7th, and very little about that pay-per-view card was known, even coming out of the arena show. Somewhere in this time frame, Heyman reportedly reached out to Smashing Pumpkins frontman and noted wrestling fan and current NWA owner Billy Corgan. Rumors have persisted over the years that Corgan was close to buying ECW from Heyman, but his recollection was a little different. Corgan claims that Heyman offered him a 10% stake for $1 million. The problem was that Corgan knew many of the wrestlers on a personal level and understood that many of them were owed substantial amounts of money. He reasoned that this million was just going to be used to cover payroll and other costs for only a little while. Knowing that this offer had little long-term viability, Corgan passed. As the calendar flipped to 2001, Heyman entertained the idea of selling. He said that in order for him to part with ECW, the buyer would have to assure major cable TV and pay off all debts. As Heyman contemplated a likely end, the TV situation went completely limp. The New York-based MSG network stopped carrying ECW Hardcore TV, while the Philadelphia syndicate began running the same December episode on a weekly loop, having not received any new tapes from the company. By the time of the January 7th pay-per-view in New York, even the more optimistic mystic of the ECW bunch was starting to lose their faith. While talents did receive a portion of their owed money at the event, many were still seven weeks behind on pay. The loss of their New York TV outlet only fragmented the already dwindling morale. Jerry Lynn didn't even bring his wrestling gear to the event, being in almost no mood to wrestle. He only did when he coerced Heyman into paying him up front for that night, and ended up wrestling in generic black trunks provided by another wrestler, which he had to hold up with electrical tape due to a difference in waist size. His opponent was RVD, flown in as the payoff to a promised surprise. Said surprise had been advertised as something truly monumental, leading hopeful fans to believe it would be the announcement of a new TV deal, or perhaps the sale of the company to someone with deeper pockets. It took a lot for an ECW fan to be even slightly underwhelmed at the sight of the whole effing show, but 2001 was a pretty dark time, and RVD probably was an underwhelming surprise. In a true sign of the times, when TV champion Rhino issued an impromptu challenge to the new world champion Sandman, he disavowed his own title, pointing out that in his words, this effing poor ass company don't even have TV. By the time ECW rolled into their final ever two shows, there was no TV champion, nor was there a physical belt, because someone reportedly stole the belt at the Queen's card in December, and it hadn't been seen since. Although television was functionally a dead issue for ECW, they still taped TV on Friday in Poplar Bluff, Missouri 
Missouri one day before another planned event in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Many notable talents that did not attend included RVD, Lynn, Kid Cash, Mikey Whipwreck, Balls Mahoney, Dawn Marie, and tag team champion Roadkill. Also absent was recent world champion Steve Carino, reportedly due to a dispute with Heyman between the pay-per-view and then, but that is one that Heyman denies. Reportedly, some of the heat stemmed from Carino refusing to blade during his match after learning what he was going to be paid. All in all, only 15 of the 28 wrestlers who worked the Sunday pay-per-view were there at those two events. Not even Heyman was in attendance. Super Crazy and Yoshihiro Tajiri were both going to skip out, but were talked into appearing by promoter Victor Quinones. He reasoned that things were tough for Heyman and they should show their support for him because Heyman was the one who had made them stars in America. Tommy Dreamer ended up filling in for Roadkill as Doring's tag team championship partner on the Saturday show, while Nova, the future Simon Dean, did so on the Friday. The 8,500 seat Pine Bluff Convention Center played host to just 1,300 fans on that fateful Saturday night. With no more shows on the horizon, it was dawning upon everyone present that, barring a genuine miracle, this was the end. The event itself was ECW enough. Super Crazy beat Tajiri, Dreamer and Doring retained the tag team belts over the FBI, and in what some might consider the last real ECW world title match, Rhino retained over Spike Dudley. In a two-match main event, Just Incredible defeated the Sandman in a brief bout via cheating, and then Sandman challenged him to an immediate rematch and fetched a dumpster full of weapons. Sandman won the more ECW-centric brawl with a pile driver. After the match, Tommy Dreamer brought trash cans full of beers to the ring, and the Roster came out to share a lengthily, legitimately tearful toast. Though Dreamer had apparently been saying backstage that the Living Dangerously pay-per-view was still tentatively on for March 11th, many saw this for what it was, the series finale. The final, scarcely seen images of ECW were of a roster saying goodbye with near certainty, while some Arkansas fans chanted, please come back. Living Dangerously never came to be. The weekend prior to its scheduled occurrence, the show was officially cancelled, replaced by an encore presentation of Guilty as Charged. As for Heyman, he showed up unexpectedly on the March 5th episode of WWE Raw, the new replacement for Jerry Lawler, who had quit the prior week. For even the most hopeful ECW hangers-on, Heyman's place at the Raw commentary desk was all the writing on the wall that they needed. A month later, ECW parent company HHG Corporation filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, a net of $7.5 million in debt. Just some of the debts included $1 million to Acclaim and $150,000 to pay-per-view distributor In Demand. Of all the wrestlers and other talent, RVD appeared to be owed the most at $150,000. Rhino himself was reportedly owed $50,000, and some like Lynn, Sandman, and New Jack had unknown listed as their amounts. By the time bankruptcy proceedings began, it had seemed like forever and a day that ECW was a functioning, however barely, wrestling company. And yet, it had only really been three months. An entity like that with such a truly hardcore fan base came to quickly notice the void left by their promotion of choice. Others have tried to co-op the ECW flavor, whether it was WWE or TNA, utilizing lost concepts and cult superstars, and even some daring indie promotions tried to assume the unclaimed mantle. But it was never the same thing. ECW was a lightning in a bottle concept, one that you had to be there in its time to truly understand, if not appreciate. 20 years have passed since the authentic ECW experience died off, the final scenes occurring just about as far away from its home as an overgrown indie promotion could be. ECW lived dangerously, loud, and caustically. But on January 13th, 2001, they went out not with a fiery wreck befitting their image, but with a tearful, borderline muted fade to black.